Well, uh, as John said, the topic today is uh, the US and Russia responsibility for leadership in a multipolar nuclear world. Uh, I know that you've had superb sessions up to this point already opening the question of nuclear weapons and its importance in the US-Russia relationship, but, but in all respects. Uh, Alexei Arbatov is, from my point of view, uh, the premier analyst in this field. There's nobody better than Alexei either in Russia or in the United States. Uh, so you were, it was a privilege for you to be able to listen to Alexei and begin understanding just how deep and sophisticated as understanding is. And then you listen to Rose Gottemuller, who I think has been as fine a negotiator of nuclear arms control with training and dealing with this issue uh, for many years, in, including her, her time in US think tanks and the period in Moscow when she directed the Carnegie Moscow Center. Uh, and there may, be, may have been other speakers that I'm overlooking who've already dealt with this. Uh, so I know that you've been exposed to um, to a number of the issues, um, probably more, certainly more competently than I'm capable of doing. Alexei is, I regard him as my teacher in this area, but I thought I would try to cast the issue in probably broader terms than they did uh, with contextual features that go beyond probably what they did. I may be mistaken, so some of this may be, may be repetitive for you. And I start by going over what has been essentially the history of Nuclear, uh, nuclear, the nuclear relationship between the United States, the Soviet Union, for the most part, and then the United States and Russia. And in doing that, I'm going to crib from Steve Miller, who is one of the fine analysts on the US side at the Kennedy School. Uh, and he divided the experience of, um, of the nuclear relationship in all of its respects into three phases. The first one, first phase, he, he, he characterized as unmanaged competition. This was a period from 1945 with the uh, explosion of the first atomic nuclear weapon on the part of the United States and use of it during the war, 1945 to 1970. Uh, he describes this period as one without order, no order, but with unmitigated competition, no dialogue, no norms, no agreements. And the result was arms racing and recurrent nuclear crises, including the famous one in October of uh, 1962. In an environment of uncertainty and worst case analysis of the other side's plans and intentions, the preoccupation during this period, 45 to 70, was with preserving uh, second strike capabilities. And that led to a constant expansion of nuclear arms, uh, particularly when both sides moved from counter value, that is counter city, weapons to counter force weapons, that is weapons by which you shoot the gun out of the hand of the other side, that is striking the missile forces themselves, and the pursuit of missile defense. Uh, and behind it, all of this, the drive was the political imperative of, of uh, not appearing to fall behind. Politically, you couldn't be seen as falling behind. And the effect was this, uh, to create a sharply scaled trajectory that ended in 1986, which is the year with the highest totals. 1986, with 70,000 nuclear warheads in the United States and Russia, 40,000 in Russia, in the United States, 30,000. Everything had been nuclearized in the area of weaponry, nuclear air defense interceptors, nuclear torpedoes, nuclear artillery, nuclear landmines, even a recoilless rifle. Uh, that was nuclear armed. Uh, and it led to rapid innovation and force modernization from bombers to ICBMs to SLBMs, and then the creation of triads uh, in air, on land, and at sea with the ICBMs, the SLBMs, and strategic bombers. The second period for, uh, as, as, um, uh, as Miller has laid it out, uh, he calls it managed rivalry, a period from 1970 to 2000, arms control replaces unfettered competition. Uh, neither it was, this period of replacing unfettered competition was neither smooth nor was it harmonious. Uh, and there were critics on both sides of the process who said that what the governments were engaging in was foolish or foolhardy. Uh, it led to also the effort to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons. Uh, the Non-Proliferation Treaty that entered into force in 1970, 
Uh, it led to constraints on missile defense. Um, that is the ABM agreement that limited missile defense to two sites and eventually then to one site for an ABM system, limiting and then reducing offensive nuclear forces in the SALT agreements uh, and eventually in the START, START agreements, that is the size and the character of forces with verification, which produced predictability that had been absent before. The institutionalization of a dialogue on nuclear issues, that was part of the negotiating of treaties, but it was in between regular consultations that addressed the question of joint management of this nuclear relationship, uh, despite the many disagreements and differences in the two sides. Uh, from Reykjavik in 1986 to the INF agreement in 1987 to the START-1 agreement in 1991 to New START in uh, 2010, and of course the original SALT agreement in 1972. Uh, today, uh, uh, he get, we get to the third phase. Uh, he calls that the tide turning. Uh, it's from 2000, 2000 to, well, 2018 in his description, but in many ways it's from 2000 to 2021 where we are now. And it is the erosion of the nuclear order that had been piecemeal uh, and in ragged fashion created in that middle period that I've just described. In 1998, India and Pakistan test nuclear weapons. In 1999, the United States votes down in the Senate the Comprehensive uh, Test Ban Treaty. Uh, start three never barely began. And in 2002, the United States withdrew from, from, the, uh, from the ABM agreement. Uh, in 2020, uh, the Trump administration walked away from the INF agreement. Uh, and then the only thing left was the new START agreement, uh, which would have expired early this year if the new administration, the Biden administration, hadn't agreed to the five-year extension that I know that you've been talking about on those other sessions. Uh, so the trend has been, here I quote Miller, the trend has been toward more extensive constraints and greater cooperation that has now been substantially reversed, meaning that the future nuclear order may be less regulated and more competitive unless, back to the title of what I'm talking about today, the United States and Russia exercise leadership. Because after all, they, too, they, they actually are the two countries that have 92% uh, of the weapons. And we enter a nuclear world at this point, your nuclear world, which is far more complex and potentially dangerous uh, than the original one during the Cold War. And as I've said, uh, in which US-Russian leadership is all the more imperative. Uh, and yet at the moment, uh, the, the steps toward achieving it have been impeded, maybe in the Biden administration, maybe what's going on now, including this last and recent effort to launch strategic stability talks that'll lead somewhere along the line to some kind of negotiation, perhaps. Uh, we may be beginning to turn the corner a little bit, but if so, uh, it's, it's still very unclear, very cloudy, not sure where we go. When I say that this is a more dangerous and complex world, it is for a number of reasons. Uh, this nuclear world, the one you live in, has evolved from what was fundamentally a two-sided order, even though we had British and French forces and along the way Chinese forces, but very much subordinate to the US-Soviet competition during uh, that point. It's now a multifarious uh, nuclear setting that adds complexity and it gives a new dimension to the familiar challenges and dangers. Uh, the challenges and dangers of the past during the Cold War, they're still all there, uh, but now there are further complications and I point to five in particular. Some of the new complications are simply a matter of multiplication. It's no longer just the United States and the Soviet Union or now the United States and Russia, it's now the United States and China. It's India and Pakistan, but it's also India and China, and it's the United States and North Korea. And in terms of geometry, these bilateral relationships in two instances have turned into trilateral nuclear relationships. The United States and Russia with China uh, over Russia's shadow and directly in America's attention 
uh, India and Pakistan, but that now is complicated by an India-Pakistan uh, trilateral Chinese dimension. Uh, secondly, as part of this multiplication, uh, all of these countries are engaged in modernizing their nuclear forces. Uh, Russia is already well along with its current phase of modernization. The United States is beginning a $1.2 trillion uh, three-decade process of modernizing all three legs of the triad, same thing in Russia. But in the other countries, there are uh, three more countries that are building triads, that is air, land, and sea. And four of the five, excluding Pakistan, are also building missile defense systems. So as I say, the first complication is uh, multiplication. The second complication is technological advancement. Technologies uh, that may lead to more effective deterrence in the eyes of those developing them by increasing the usability of weapons. And therefore, uh, as uh, the argument is in increasing the usability of weapons, enhancing credibility, the flexibility, the confidence of decision makers and so on. But it also increases, as I say, usability. That's what is supposed to enhance deterrence, but usability then increases the likelihood of use in some at least heuristic or uh, theoretical sense. That and all of this in turn raises concern over the survivability of nuclear forces, uh, which begins to again raise questions about the durability of strategic stability, the concept of strategic stability in the, in the bilateral relationships, uh, in the case particularly of US and Russia, but others as well. It blurs the line between conventional and nuclear war fighting. Uh, the third is the risk of transforming space warfare into an integral part of nuclear warfare. Uh, and in a crisis, fourth, potentially it decreases decision-making time. These new weapons are designed to operate very rapidly, particularly uh, the, the uh, hypersonic weapons that are being developed. Uh, as I say, hypersonic boost glide and cruise missiles. Uh, and then the development of smaller, yield, lower yield weapons, more accurate weapons, uh, which is part of what I think is a growing danger at this point in the part of the United States and Russia together, and that is returning to the notion of limited use, uh, limited options in, in, a, in a political military crisis. Um, and then among the technologies, new sensing technologies, uh, which will improve information for real-time decision-making, but may also increase the vulnerability of the other side. Then there are uh, finally the uh, the new fronts, well, next to finally, the new fronts of cyber and artificial intelligence. Uh, and third, there is the uh, stress that concepts that once were dominant uh, and more or less in place during the original Cold War, that these concepts are now under stress. Uh, strategic deterrence, for example, takes on a more complex coloration when nuclear and non-nuclear deterrence are integrated, which is what Russia and the United States are doing. Uh, and at a more primitive level, what India and Pakistan, China uh, are moving toward as well. Uh, the task is to transform nuclear and conventional weapons along with cyber and other hybrid to tools into what is sometimes referred to as a comprehensive deterrence mosaic. That's very complicated, uh, and it raises challenge for other concepts, essential concepts like, like strategic stability, uh, crisis stability, that is uh, the obstacles to or the breaks on the resort to nuclear weapons in a political military crisis. Uh, those breaks, uh, those limitations, those guardrails are threatened by the development I've just described. And that's further threatened by what I referred to a moment ago the resumed focus on limited nuclear options. Uh, and that in turn, uh, in, the, in the case of countries, not the United States, uh, Soviet Union, Russia, which have never had a notion of minimum deterrence through no first use postures, uh, question those who do have them, China and India have, uh, India somewhat qualified, but China and India have no first use postures. And there's a real question of whether um, not whether they meant it when, when they articulated or still don't mean it, 
uh, but whether or not it holds, whether or not moving away from it, particularly in the case of the Chinese. Uh, and the ultimate question then is, can there be crisis stability? That is breaks and obstacles to or impediments on the resort to nuclear weapons in a political military crisis. That's crisis stability. Uh, and can there be crisis stability in this now cluttered and heterogeneous nuclear environment, which is your nuclear environment, can it, can it be even in that key bilateral relationship where all of these ideas were developed, the US-Soviet, US-Russia relationship, and at the basis of strategic stability was you, as you know from your discussions uh, and the, uh, in, the interaction you've had with Alexei Arbatov and Rose Gottemuller and others, uh, so-called MAD or mutual assured destruction was, the basic notion that is uh, that would that would uh, block either side from thinking of using nuclear weapons first. Uh, and finally, there is this contested realm of nuclear norms, uh, always murky and unsettled, but even more so now. Uh, the nuclear taboo, that is, um, that there was something fundamentally illegitimate about the idea of even using nuclear weapons, that at the most nuclear weapons were to deter the use of nuclear weapons and not to serve other purposes. Uh, but the idea of sole purpose, that is nuclear weapons only to deter nuclear use uh, and as opposed to nuclear weapons that could be used for other purposes, uh, which now are built into na national security doctrines, both in Russia and in the United States, and the resistance to the idea of sole purpose as a, as a proposition. The United States and Russia have always uh, rejected sole purpose. The Indians and the, pa and the Chinese have had a different, a different uh, take on that. And then the question of the future of the nuclear test ban treaty itself and so on. So as a result, uh, the pathways to what I think is the greatest danger right now, not accidental nuclear war or accidental nuclear weapon, that, they, that always exists, accidental explosions of nuclear weapons uh, or the deliberate use of nuclear weapons in wartime, but the inadvertent nuclear war. Uh, and I think the risk of inadvertent nuclear war is multiplying across more regions and across more relationships. Some of, several of them are tension filled. And the, the other part of your nuclear environment is that this is not a period when major nuclear powers, the United States and Russia, the United States and China, India and Pakistan, India and China are moving toward detente. All of these countries are an increasingly, or at least uh, initially tension-filled and increasingly tension-laden relationships. Um, that, uh, so that adds to the problem. Uh, and then you add to all of this in the case of US-Russia relationship, that the bilateral arms control regime has been slowly dismantled uh, as, was, as was evident in the Miller summary of it. Well, I know, that, uh, I know that all of this produces what uh, some of us in the field refer to as for audiences such as you, Migos, M-E-G-O, Migos, my eyes glaze over, my eyes glaze over. So I'm, I'm going to show you some pictures and then we'll come back and I'll conclude with some further comments. So here's the first picture that I want to show you, which is where we stand as of 2020. It's changed a little bit, uh, but I'll let you look at that. You see where the deployed weapons are, how many of them are, Russia and the United States. China, if you've been reading the newspapers, you know that China is, have been building two large fields for presumably uh, ICBM force, probably the DF-41, which uh, is an intercontinental ballistic missile. And there are people who believe that the Chinese, when fairly short order in the next, I don't know whether two, three, four, five, seven years, will go up to roughly 700 nuclear weapons. Uh, but again, look at deployed and stockpiled and then retired weapons uh, among uh, the various possessors. You see now nine nuclear powers. Here's the multiplication problem that I was talking about. Uh, and then you can do the geometry of it too in terms of bilateral, trilateral relationships. Here's another picture. This is the Sarmat. This is the new Russian missile. It has been tested uh, and it's being deployed. I believe the deployment begins this year. Uh, this is capable of carrying up to 10 uh, multiple independently uh, targeted reentry vehicles. Uh, 
Um, we don't know the precise size of each of those vehicles. It could be up to 500 kiloton. Uh, the weapons that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki were 15 kiloton. Uh, so uh, this weapon system, uh, take, take a look at what will be fielded. They're probably going to be 46 of them fielded in the next couple of years on the Russian side. This is a, a study that was done by FEMA, the Federal Emergency uh, Organization in the United States of a nuclear attack on the United States. And the one that matters are those purple triangles. The black dots are if Russia targets the United States with 2000 nuclear warheads. Under the current arms control agreement, start, as you know, the limit is 1,550 and not all 500, 1,550 would be actually used but 500, and that would be easily done uh, while reserving a very large force for Russia, given the numbers that I showed you in that first slide, take a look at the triangles. And I'll come back to this in a moment with a couple of stories that let you uh, have an impression. Uh, I don't know where you are in the United States, but I can't imagine that you're not subject to one of those triangles, wherever you are. This is the next pe picture. This is our SLBM. This is the Trident D5, uh, which is deployed on, uh, it'll be, de it's deployed currently on the Typhoon. It'll be deployed on the, uh, on the Ohio. Uh, it carries, it can carry up to, uh, I think 10 or more reentry vehicles, but it's probably with five reentry vehicles. Uh, the size of them is not entirely clear, depending on the warhead. The largest warhead would be 400 megaton, probably not. The next warhead that's probably on it is 96 kiloton. But unfortunately, and what's destabilizing is that we are putting now some, for this these limited nuclear options and low yield weapons, we're putting some very small warheads on some of these D5 weapons. These are weapons with fewer than 12 kiloton that is smaller than the weapon used against Hiroshima. But the problem in terms of strategic stability, if you're on the Russian side and one of these things is coming at you, do you know whether it's 96 kiloton, therefore strategic, or do you think it might be simply a limited nuclear option weapon? This is the way it looks when it comes off of that, uh, when it comes off of the submarine force. But if this is the US and the Russian picture, here's India. This is India's Agni-3. Uh, and actually, uh, India is now moving on to an Agni-5, which looks, it's A-G-N-I, but Agni-5 is, um, now, uh, is now tested and ready for deployment. It is their first intercontinental ballistic missile. This was a missile that was developed for Pakistan. The, the other one that looks like this is 8,000 8, kilometers. It can cover any part of China. And therefore, we're back to the we're back to the geometry. We're back to the triangles. Uh, and this is this is only a portion of their forces. They have a number of other weapons that are intermediate range that are designed primarily for uh, for local weapons. This is a Nasser. This is a Pakistan Pakistani weapon. It's a su it's sub sub kiloton. Each of those missiles. Therefore, it's a tactical weapon. It's designed to be used on the battlefield against conventional forces, against Indian conventional forces. Uh, and I'll come back to that as well. So uh, that's what I wanted to show you by way of picture. And then I'm going to tell you a couple of, uh, go through a couple of uh, other things. I want to get back to what I need. As I said, this is to address your my eyes glaze over. Uh, but now let me put this in more concrete terms that may also help you uh, for your to prevent your eyes from glazing over too much. If one of these weapons that I've showed you, most of them, uh, detonated over the Pentagon, the superheated, so go back to those triangles that I showed you on the FEMA report. If one of them detonated over the Pentagon, the superheated air would create a rapidly expanding fireball one mile wide and 200 billion degrees of heat at its center. A half second later, three quarters of a mile away at Pentagon City, the streets would dissolve 
and metal surfaces would melt. And then a blast wave with 750 mile per hour winds would crush buildings and turn automobiles into fiery projectiles. Four seconds later, the heat and the blast would incinerate the Lincoln and Jefferson memorials, would melt and crumple the aluminum, aluminum exterior of planes at Riga National Airport and set their interiors on fire. Three miles away, the clothing of people outdoors would burst into flames and the exposed parts of their bodies would suffer third degree burns. The detonation would create what is called, in my view, something of an understatement, a large area fire. That's what it's labeled with a radius between three and a half and four and a half miles producing hurricane force winds with temperatures boiling, that is 212 degrees Fahrenheit and devastating an area 40 to 65 square miles, 10 to 15 times wider than the 15 kiloton bomb that, that was used to destroy Hiroshima. That's just one of the bombs uh, detonating over the Pentagon. Let me continue uh, with another illustration. This is India and Pakistan. Together they have, as you remember from that first chart, between 270 and 290 nuclear warheads. That's many fewer than, than the 12,000 plus in the holdings of Russia and the United States, uh, 6,000 plus that are actually deployed. But were they to go to a large scale nuclear war using most of them, and as aspects of their current nuclear posture suggest, they well might do, that's the way their doctrines and their postures and their public description of their likely reactions in, a, in, a, uh, in, a, in, the, in the context of nuclear use, the radioactive, radioactive fallout would drift as far as Australia. Radiation contamination would poison the fresh waters of the rivers of the Himalayas reaching into China. And the dust, the ash, and the soot that would be pumped high into the atmosphere would not dissipate for several years. It would block sunlight and lower temperatures that could eventually destroy crops, potentially causing the starvations of millions across Asia and beyond. And it's that last proposition, that last phenomena, that's the real threat from the use of nuclear weapons, not the original loss of life from the blast itself, but the lingering effects from each stage in terms of what follows after an explosion. So, as I've said, uh, from my point of view, the real risk is that we would get to any of these scenarios, not the result of deliberate use, but as a result of inadvertent nuclear war and the things that are being done now that I think enhance the risk of inadvertent nuclear war, including Pakistan's notion of battlefield, use of battlefield nuclear weapons. The Pakistanis evidently believe that in the case of an Indian so-called cold start conventional offensive that has overrun Pakistani conventional defenses, they can use that Nasser that I showed you in that Pakistan on the conventional battlefield, and it will not be escalatory. It will not lead to further nuclear escalation. India's nuclear doctrine is any use of any kind of nuclear weapon will lead to, they don't like the idea of massive retaliation, but what they call large scale punitive use. Well, the last thing I'll finish and then we can talk is what are, what are, what's, what's involved with something like inadvertent nuclear, nuclear war, how you get to it. And here I'm gonna to read to you a segment from a report publication from Robert McNamara, the American minister, secretary of defense during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And it's in the context of the Cuban Missile Crisis. He writes, the contingency plans called for a first day air attack of 1,080 sorties, a huge attack. An invasion of 180,000 troops was assembled in the southeastern US ports. Had Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev not publicly announced on that Sunday, October 28th, that he was removing the missiles, I believe that on Monday, a majority of Kennedy's military and civilian advisors would have recommended launching the attacks. During subsequent conferences in Havana in January 1992, with my, that McNamara was participating in, we were told by the former Warsaw Pact Chief of Staff, General Anatoly Gribkov, that in 1962, 
The Soviet forces in Cuba possessed not only nuclear warheads for their intermediate range missiles target on US cities, but nuclear bombs and tactical nuclear warheads as well. The tactical warheads were to be used against US invasion forces. At the time, the CIA was reporting no warheads on the island. They believed that the first batch was to be delivered by a Russian ship named the Poltava, hence the quarantine in the Cuban Missile Crisis. We learned more. Soviet forces on Cuba possessed a total of 162 nuclear warheads, including at least 90 tactical warheads. And on October 26, 1962, a moment of great tension, warheads were moved from their storage sites to positions closer to their delivery vehicles in anticipation of a US invasion. Although a US invasion force would not have been equipped with tactical nuclear warheads, President Kennedy and I had specifically prohibited that. No one should, no one should believe that had American troops been attacked with nuclear weapons, the United States would have refrained from a nuclear response. Okay, now it's for, uh, time for us to talk.